I creatively named this session Unraveling the Mystery of the 1031 Exchange, Greg. So you've got to live up to that buildup. Uh, I'm Mike Ferrante with Century 21 Homestar. Uh, broker, owner, broker owner Tony Geraci is here as well. He sponsors these weekly training sessions. And from time to time, we bring in experts uh, to learn from and you know share knowledge. So that's what we're all about today. Um, real quick, contact info if you need to get a hold of me. Email is always best. It's Mike at 21mike.com. Uh, Tony loves to text, so uh, try hitting him up at text at 216-374-1269. And you know what, Greg, I'm going to just go ahead and have you introduce yourself. I mean, I'll do a quick intro, but you know, tell us uh, your qualifications and who you're with. Um, so Greg Smith Esquire, which I understand uh, you, you're also an attorney then, and um, you are the guru, so to speak, of 1031 exchanges, and you do some CEUs. And I know a lot of us are working with investors these days. So the whole 1031 exchange thing is a really hot topic. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Greg, and then we'll dive into the 1031 stuff. Yeah, well, thank you, Mike. And thanks, Tony. Appreciate uh, being here today. And uh, yeah, amazingly, as time flies, I've been doing nothing but 1031 exchanges now with IPX 1031 for the last 19 years. So it's really uh, starting to add up. Uh, I, uh, I attended the Ohio State University College of Law and graduated back in 96. And uh, after that was in private practice for a few years, worked as a closing and underwriting attorney for a few years. And then now the last 19 with IPX. So IPX is the country's largest qualified intermediary. That means we're the company that helps with 1031 exchanges. And we'll talk more about that uh, as we go through this today. Yeah, sounds good. So I'll reiterate to everybody, um, I'm, I've got you all muted on entry. If you have questions, hit us up in the chat box. That's the best way toward the end, we'll let you unmute if there's something that's too long to type in the chat box. Um, I think most of us here uh, kind of have a basic understanding, Greg, that the 1031 exchange is a way to defer capital gains taxes. But why don't you start us off with a kind of an overview definition, pretend like uh, we've only heard of a 1031 exchange, but we don't really know what it is. Sure, absolutely. And yeah, you know, in its most basic concept, it's the idea that when you sell your real property and you don't want to pay your capital gain taxes, the IRS is nice enough to say, if you fully reinvest in the more property, where, you know, and we'll go over some details later, but where basically you're not pocketing any of the cash from the sale and you're not being relieved of any of the debt from the old property, but the numbers all match up into property B from the property that you sold property A, then they'll pretend like no sale took place. So you don't have to pay any of the federal or state capital gain taxes. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing that allows you to reinvest 100% of your money into new property and you know it doesn't it doesn't apply to other types of investments. So if you go out and you sell your Microsoft stock and you want to reinvest that into Amazon. If you have a gain on your Microsoft, you got to pay the taxes on that. So obviously there's not as much money to put into the Amazon stock. So this is something really beautiful for real estate and a, a fantastic uh, uh, investment opportunity. Now I've, I've heard it, the term coined like rolling that investment over or rolling it into, is, is that like, am I using that term properly? Yeah, rollover is, is, is pretty accurate for what you're doing. So you're, you're rolling over the proceeds from the sale. And, and to be very specific, you have to do two things to get 100% tax deferral, but that's not required, but most people want that. So the first thing you have to do is reinvest all of your net proceeds from the sale. And my dog is making an appearance. If he, if he keeps moaning, I'll build them out. But uh, so you have to reinvest your net proceeds. And so that's after your real estate commissions and title fees and everything else you would see on a closing statement, you know, what's left, get that to the qualified intermediary, use that towards your replacement property. And then the second thing is, if you paid off mortgage debt at the sale, let's say you paid $150,000 off to the bank at your initial closing, they want to see you get a new loan of $150,000 or more on the new property. So if those two things match up or go higher, then you defer 100% of all taxes. And it's Got truly it. amazing how many people don't understand that. I know it's certainly not common sense by any stretch, but I get people calling and arguing with me over and they say, oh, no, no, I just need to reinvest my gain or I just need to reinvest the cash from closing. And unfortunately, that's, that's not how it works. 
it is really based on your sale price. And then they're nice enough to let you take off those closing costs. But whatever that number is, that becomes your magic number to get 100% tax deferral. But nice. if you're someone, if you say, hey, I want to keep $10,000 at the initial closing because I have some bills I want to pay or a vacation I want to take, that's okay. It just means that $10,000 will end up as taxable boot. You'll pay a couple thousand dollars in taxes on that, but you can defer the rest of the taxes through the exchange. Got it. You know, I think it would be worthwhile to define capital gain for us as well. And, and then the, you know, the capital gain tax, you know, could you briefly explain what a capital gain is and then uh, essentially what the tax on, on that is? Absolutely. And yeah, there's a few different facets to it, but the capital gain is really as simple as, hey, you bought the property for a hundred thousand, you're selling it now for 200,000, you've got a hundred thousand dollars of appreciation and the government wants to tax you on that. Mm -hmm. So to be specific on the taxes, uh, when you own a property over a number of years, one of the great things about real estate is you get depreciation to your benefit, which means, let's say you buy a property for $500,000 and the building value is 400 and the land is 100,000. Then you take that 400,000 of improvement value if it's residential property, you divide it by 27.5. If it's commercial property, you divide it by 39 because that's thought to be the lifespan of your improvements. So in theory, over those number of years, it's gonna crumble away into dust and there'll be nothing left but the land. So because of that logic, they give you a tax break as your property is theoretically going down in value. So each year you can take that depreciation credit and use it to offset income, the rents that are coming in on your property. And that could be a fantastic thing. But lo and behold, when you go to sell that property down the road and maybe it didn't crumble away and actually it went up in value, then the government says, all right, the total of those depreciation credits we gave you through the years, we're gonna tax that at 25%. So that can be the biggest tax in a lot of deals. Then you're looking at that difference. Oh, if I bought it at 100,000 and sold it for 200,000, roughly you've got 100,000 of appreciation. That's going to be taxed somewhere between 15% at the low end up to potentially 23.8% at the high end, depending if you hit some higher income level thresholds. And then, of course, don't forget about state tax. So in Ohio, they're going to get you for about 5% when all is said and done. Some states like California at 13.3%. Are much higher. And then there's states that are lower down to 0%. So Florida, right? Florida is zero. Yeah, yeah, Florida and Texas and Nevada and a few others are at zero. So um, varies quite a bit state to state, but here in Ohio, 5%. So that's, you know, can still be another significant tax bill in this. So got it. You always, so, yeah, please. Yeah, this is a huge number. I mean, it could be a potentially huge number, thousands and thousands of dollars that we're talking about deferring. And that's why this is so important. Um, Greg, one more tax question. Well, yeah, I guess a gain question, capital gain. Um, can you briefly tell us the difference between a short-term and a long-term capital gain? Right. So once you've owned a property more than a year, you're into the long-term capital gain category. And this can actually be um, you know, added up. So if you owned a property for, let's say, six months and you sold it, and then you did 1031 exchange, own the new property just over six months, go and sell it, you would have gotten yourself into long-term cap, uh, capital gains territory, even though each property was only owned about six months. So uh, they do they do add on to each other. Got it. I did not realize that. That's great. So let's get into 1031 because we're already, I see we're already nine minutes in and we haven't really got there. So let's say that um, I'm a property owner and I've decided to sell and I want to buy something else and I, uh, I'm a candidate for a 1031 exchange. Can you walk me through that process? How do I start? Like, uh, I know I'm gonna hire a realtor to sell the property, but like, when do I contact you? And, and just walk me through those beginning steps. Yeah, and most of it will feel the same as usual up front. So you, you hire your real estate agent, you can go ahead and get into contract on your sale. We do think it's a good idea to mention the 1031 exchange in your contract anything along the lines of seller intends to exchange, buyer agrees to cooperate is sufficient. Uh, if it's not there, it's not gonna ruin the deal. Our documents as a QI will still take care of the actual IRS requirements, 
but it's a good idea for various reasons to mention it. Q, QI, Greg, uh, we're, we're all guilty of using the lingo and abbreviations. I don't know QI though, what is that? Yeah, so QI stands for Qualified Intermediary. It's a term that comes out of the treasury regulations and it's you have to use a company called a Qualified Intermediary like ours to hold the proceeds until you reinvest those into the new property. And we also do the paperwork that would keep the IRS happy in the transaction. Uh, what's interesting about QI is you don't actually have to be qualified in any way, which is a little scary. You just have to avoid being disqualified. Okay, so anyone with an agency relationship to the taxpayer or the seller here uh, cannot act as the qualified intermediary. So you're not allowed to have your attorney do it. You can't have your accountant do it. You can't have your real estate agent do it and so on. It has to be an independent third party is what the IRS wants to see. Uh, rather than someone who's already beholden to you in various ways as your agent. So uh, it also can't be a relative or an employee. But once you get past those categories of people that can't do it, what's scary is anyone can do it. You don't have to have any training or knowledge or degrees or anything else. So everyone on the call does want to be, you want to be very much aware of that do your homework on who your QI is, make sure it's a reputable company, make sure they've got a third party guarantee, errors and omissions insurance, uh, bonding and so on. Uh, because unfortunately, like in other walks of life, there are bad actors, people do run off with the money. We've seen billions of dollars over time stolen in this industry, lost through bankruptcy, lost through mistakes. So, you know, do your homework and make sure you're with a good, strong, reputable company and that your money is safe. Got it. So I, I decide I'm going to sell my property. I hire my agent. It sells just like that because it's a hot market. I want to give everyone the heads up that I intend on doing the 1031 exchange. Take me from that point. Yeah. So <laughs> we always say the earlier you can talk to us, the better, because that's always safer. Uh, we do have the people who call from the closing table and say, hey, we thought this was taken care of. Uh, we need the 1031 put together. We say, all right, go have a cup of coffee, ask the title agent to email us a copy of the contract and the title commitment. We review both those documents, and then we draft up the exchange paperwork and closing instructions, get those out to the exchanger and to the title company. So although it can be done quickly in some situations, there's others, you know, more the rare situations, but they do come up where there's seller financing involved that has to be dealt with or there's an LLC where some members want to exchange and others don't, that can't be dealt with at the closing table. There's got to be planning to make sure those types of 1031 exchanges are done right. Uh, but you'll want to get in touch with the QI, get them in touch with your title company, get the paperwork put together, because you are required to sign all the, the paperwork for the 1031 prior to the time the sale goes through. I probably get at least two calls a week, Mike, from people who say, hey, I, I closed on Friday and now it's Monday, but I told the title company not to give me the money yet or I haven't cashed the check. Unfortunately, it is too late at that point. The IRS looks at it and they say, if you even have the right to receive the money, it's too late. So the QI has to be in place because we, we become the technical seller in the deal, even though we don't go into the chain of title on the vast majority of 1031 exchanges, we do become the technical seller and that's why the title company sends the money into our exchange account that we've set up on behalf of the taxpayer. So, so that's the initial uh, steps to get it set up. Now, after the closing, they are going to wire that money into your exchange account. From that closing date, you've got 45 days to identify the replacement property that you, may, you might want to buy. So it's not written in stone and you have a little bit of leeway, but once you get to day 46, now it's locked in. Whatever's on your list, that's all you can buy. You can't change it in any way, shape, or form. So you do want to move very quickly. So for better or worse, the way things are right now with properties moving so fast, we're actually seeing most exchanges are still being successfully handled. Uh, but rather than maybe closing three months down the road, you know, a lot of times people are closing two weeks after they sell because they go after that property, they need to instantly get into contract, they have to offer a quick closing, all those things, but that's fine. And that works well when your money is already sitting with the QI and you're ready to go. So uh, we're going to make sure you identify properly within the 45 day period if you're going to go past that. 
And then when you're ready to buy the replacement property, it's a little bit of the same process. You let us know the title agent you're working with. We'll ask them to send us the contract, title commitment, and their wiring instructions. Once we've reviewed those items, we'll draft up the little bit of paperwork needed for the back end. And then you as the client, you'll sign off to authorize the wire to be sent in for the replacement property purchase to complete your exchange. So that's so, kind of the basic nutshell of it. Going, going back to the identification of the property, if I remember correctly, you, you can, I mean, obviously you don't know for sure that you're going to be able to score a property because as you said, they're selling quickly. So are we able to identify up to, is it three properties or how does that part work? Because I know I've had people reach out to me and say, oh, I'm doing a 1031. I've got to identify properties that are potential replacements for the property I just sold. So we're, you know, think, uh, remember your audience here is mainly realtors who are helping uh, with that part of the process. So t talk more about that. I don't quite understand it. Yeah, no, that, that's right. So 90% of the time, exchangers are operating under what's called the three property rule. So the IRS allows you to name up to three potential target properties with no restrictions as to price or anything else. And so even in situations where you've already locked your client into contract on something before day 45, and maybe they're going to close out on day 50, then that's going to be listed as property number one, but they're welcome to name a couple of backup properties. So just in case the deal falls through for some reason, at least they have a couple other properties they could consider, do their due diligence on, and maybe still use to complete their exchange. And then there are cases where people want to name more than three properties. And let's say your client sold for a million dollars, but they want to diversify and they want to buy four $250,000 properties, right? Well, the three property rule obviously won't work. They want to be able to name four or more if they want some backups. So the IRS came up with this 200% rule. So if the property you sold was a million dollars, your 200% limit would be $2 million. So that means you could go name eight properties averaging $250,000 in value and maybe go acquire four of those to defer all your taxes. So if you're not using the three property rule, you'll be using what's called the 200% rule. And again, the 200% rule only helps you when you're naming some properties of lesser value. When you use the three property rule, you can name properties any value you want. So if you sold for a million, maybe you're naming one for a million and one for two million, one for 50 million, that's fine. The values don't matter under the three property rule. They only matter under the 200% rule. Got it, you anticipated my next question. Um, let me ask another question. Let's say that I identify three properties and I'm thinking I'm either gonna buy one for a million or I'm gonna buy two of these uh, $500,000 properties and I end up going with the two 500s, but one of them falls through. Now I'm only purchasing a $500,000 property. I'm assuming that I only get to defer part of the uh, tax then and the other part I end up paying tax on. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. In those situations, if, if you know going into it, sometimes clients tell us ahead of time, hey, I'm selling for a million. We already know what we want to buy. It's going to be 500,000. And that's the, that's the plan from the get-go, not because something fell through. And that's where we're going to tell them, hey, go back and talk to your accountant, crunch the numbers on what that's going to mean for you. If that client has a really low basis in that million dollar property they're selling, let's say their tax basis is $100,000, so they've got $900,000 of gain in that sale, then buying for $500,000 is definitely going to make sense. They're still going to defer a lot of taxes and they'll, they'll get a good value out of their 1031 exchange. But in a case where they might say, oh, my tax basis is 700,000. So I've got about a $300,000 gain when I sell for a million dollars. And we plan just to go buy a property for 500,000. What's likely going to happen there is they'll end up paying all the taxes they would have paid anyway, because the IRS is initially going to look at it and say, you sold for a million, only bought for 500,000. That's 500,000 of taxable boot right there. Now, in the end, you've only got 300,000 of gain, so you're not going to pay tax on 500,000, but you might pay tax on the entire gain you, you would have paid without the 1031 exchange. So, um, yeah, it depends what the tax basis is. It's okay to keep some cash or buy down in value, but they don't want to go too far before the exchange won't make sense. What if I've identified my properties, but because of the state of the market, I'm not able to get any of them? Is there any allowance to identify more properties? 
uh, so, the game? Yeah, it really is a no mercy provision uh, with the real exception being some kind of natural disaster going on in the middle of your exchange that affects you somehow. Uh, other than that, there's, there's no mercy. Once you're past day 45, you are locked in. So you're allowed to change it all you want. So if you're someone that wanted to identify early and you send us your identification form on day 10, and now you're at, out at day 30 and you say, all right, a couple of those properties have already sold to somebody else. I want to change it. That's okay. You can change it as much as you want right up to midnight on the 45th day. But once you're to day 46, you are locked in. And sadly, there's, there's no mercy there. Got it. So again, I got my realtor hat on. So I'm thinking as a realtor, if I've got a listing and I receive an offer that specifically says this is for a 1031 exchange, it seems to me that I might have some extra leverage as the seller because I know that I'm one of only possibly three properties that you've identified. You kind of need my property, especially if options one and two have already fallen through. So for all the realtors listening, when we write the offer for the properties that we're trying to buy, do we need to have that in the contract? And is there any way to not do it so that we're not divulging right away that this is for a 1031 exchange? Right. So the first thing I would say, even though I've heard a lot of stories through the years, I haven't really ever been able to verify with anyone that this ever actually becomes a problem. Not once. I mean, I'm sure there are a few here and there where it's become an issue and someone's tried to take advantage of it. But by and large, it, it is truly not a big problem out there. But there is nothing wrong with not putting it into the contract because it's not required by the IRS. So um, I won't bore you with all the details. There are advantages with putting into the contract. Uh, one example is a fully signed contract that mentions a 1031 exchange counts as a valid identification. If the fully signed contract doesn't mention the 1031, it doesn't count. So if somehow they've messed up and not sent their form back to us as a qualified intermediary, they would still have a saving grace if they mentioned their contract, which they wouldn't otherwise. So there are some good reasons to have it there, uh, but it's not required. What the IRS specifically requires is that an exchanger makes the other party aware of the 1031 exchange, but they don't care when you do that. So we can do that down the road. Um, you can do that at the time of closing. That's often what happens. So I wouldn't get too bent out of shape. If you have a client that doesn't want it in there, don't put it in there. That's okay. It'll all still work out. I was, yeah, just a curiosity question. So sure. let me make a quick announcement here. So Tony, I'm going to go ahead and click, you know, to see if you want to ask any additional questions. Guys, the chat box is open. Go ahead and drop a chat here. I'm just going to type a quick note that says chat. So if you have questions, drop it there. Um, and then uh, the, it, once Tony chimes in here, uh, Greg, what I'd like to kind of ask you is sort of a closing question is anything else we should know? And then lastly, I want to know, uh, you know, frankly, we've talked enough that if I had a 1031 client, I wouldn't hesitate to send them to you, but I wanted to give you a chance to say, you know, you, as you said, it, almost anyone can do it as long as they don't meet any of those disqualifying criteria. But I wanted to give you a chance to just tell people, you know, like, why, why you as opposed to somebody else? So let's go to Tony first to see if he's got any questions to add. Uh, the only question I had, and I don't think I caught this if you, if you said it, is that what happens if you decide to just dissolve it? You're like, ah, I'm just going to, I didn't find anything. Is it hard to dissolve, you know, what you have uh, set up? Sure. Yeah. Good question, Tony. So it is strange. Under the Treasury regulations at good old 1.1031 K1G6, they tell us these really annoying rules, which are that because the qualified intermediary is actually thought of as the principal in the transaction by the IRS, and we're not an agent of the taxpayer, that when a taxpayer calls us up and says, hey, I've changed my mind. I just want to cancel the exchange, send my money back it's very regulated how we do that. So the rules are, if you're in that 45 day period, the, the initial identification period, and you cancel your exchange, you do have to wait till day 46 to get your funds back. So on day 46, we're gonna wire those funds back. The exchanger will end up just paying their taxes as normal and they won't report a 1031 because on their next tax return, they won't bother with that because they didn't complete it. So the IRS actually won't even know they tried a 1031 exchange. What's annoying is if you're past day 45 
and you have identified properties to buy, then by law, we have to wait till day 181 to send those funds back to the exchanger. So once in a while that does happen, someone cancels somewhere along the way, or it could be that situation where they identified three properties, they all sold to other people and they're not going after those any longer. Uh, so by law, you do have to wait till day 181 to get those funds back. Um, it's just a strange way they wrote up some of these laws. No, oh, great. That's perfect. That's what I wanted to know. Yeah, thank you. Greg, someone's asking uh, how we contact you and is there a guide for when to use a 1031 exchange versus when we shouldn't? Uh, yeah, definitely uh, want to make sure that we get your contact information. Why don't we do that now in case anybody has to leave because we're already at 1156. So let's do your contact information. Uh, and then if you could answer that question about when we might use it, when we might not, and if there's a guide, and then please, we want to hear more about you and, and why we would use you as opposed to someone else for these services. Sure. So let me give you two things. I'll give you my email address first. If you want to write this down, it's uh, greg.smith, just like you see on the screen there, G-R-E-G, -E then period, S-M-I-T-H, and it's at I-P-X. So that's I for investment, P as in property, X like x-ray, 1031.com. So greg.smith at ipx1031.com. Uh, Toll-free number is an easy one. So it's 866-443-1031. Again, that's 866-443-1031. Uh, there's never any charge to call and ask questions and go over things. Uh, that's always uh, something we're happy to do. We'll walk you through what works, doesn't work. And only if you do, do decide to do the 1031 exchange where there'd be any fees down the road. And that'll even happen once those funds are wired into the exchange account, then the fees are taken out at that point. So nothing up front is ever due. And uh, you know, like, like Mike mentioned, uh, so give you a quick plug here, and I won't overdo it, but we are by IPX, we are by far the largest and safest qualified intermediary in the country. I've been doing this 19 years. We have people all over across the country have been in it a lot of years with me. Uh, we have a specialized department to do reverse and construction exchanges, which are a whole different animal and take a while to talk about. Uh, we have a specialized banking department. We actually have two banking departments, one out of our Chicago office and one out of California to help with time zones. And uh, we're, we're, a, we're a massive company as far as qualified intermediary goes. And, uh, you know, certainly would love to help you out. Um, and so there's, um, I'll circle back to uh, Michael's question, but, um, you know, we, we're at 1158. Greg, I don't want to impose on you, but if you have a little more time, I mean, I know I have learned so much in this short time. Do you have a few minutes to stay over in case anyone has questions? Absolutely. I'm happy to stay. <laughs> okay, wonderful. I, I appreciate that. Um, so uh, his specific question, question was about, uh, you know, is there a guide for when we might use a 1031 versus when we shouldn't? Uh, I did, by the way, type Greg's contact info in the chat box, but you guys can always uh, message me as well. Uh, Mike at 21mike.com. Obviously, I know how to get a hold of Greg. But yeah, go ahead, Greg, if you could answer that. Yeah. So anyone who wants, shoot me an email and I can respond and I'll send you our short brochure and our longer book of information. And the book is quite detailed. And then on top of that, you know, it'll have the information for our website there's kind of more information there than you'd ever want. <laughs> Every, everything under the sun is covered in that website somewhere, whether it's calculators to help you figure out your taxes or information on sort of obscure topics. Uh, it's all there somewhere. And I can certainly help you find that if you need it. But the book is very helpful. I can email that out to you. Um, and that certainly uh, will answer a lot of questions. And then again, don't, don't hesitate to to reach out and shoot me an email or give me a call anytime. But yeah, shoot me an email. I'll send the book and brochure to you. Sorry, I muted myself. Uh, if you could send that to me, Greg, I'll, I'll ping you on that. Uh, Dean Michael's asking about fees. You know, I'm assuming we're saving taxes, but obviously you're performing a service. What, can you give us an overview of what that looks like? Sure. So we charge flat fees for exchanges. 
the fee to set up the exchange and handle the sale is $1,000 and the fee for the replacement property purchase is $250. So most exchanges end up costing exactly $1,250 when all is said and done. Now we just up those fees by $250 at the, at the start of this year. Uh, if you've got a smaller deal, if your client's selling property for $100,000, even maybe $200,000 or less, things like that, I can still bump it back to last year's prices. We're not looking to you know, have this be excessive or a problem for anyone relative to the taxes they would pay. Uh, so we can still do it at $750 on the front end and $250 on the back end. Certainly still a discount we're, we're willing to give. Um, so that's the kind of price range you're looking at. Now, if they're doing the more complicated type of exchange, like the reverse exchange, where a client wants to buy the new property first and sell last, or a construction exchange where they wanna add value to the new property that will count in the tax numbers. In those deals, we actually have to take title to the property to make that work. Those are much more expensive. Uh, that has to be factored in. You're looking at fees that'll start at the, the $5,000 range, but it can get up to seven, 8,000 or so, depending on the value of the property we have to take title to, whether a lender's involved, whether it's commercial or residential, things like that. So most, again, 90% of exchanges will be the lower fees, but reverse or construction can be much more significant. Okay, uh, I've got a, another question here. I think I understand it, but uh, Dean, Michael, if, if um, oh, I see what the question is. So he's saying if, if if we're if we start a 1031 exchange but it doesn't go through let's say the sale the purchases fall through um, sure. do you guys still collect a fee right most of our work is done on the front end in the in the background of it we review the contract we review the title commitment work with the title company draft up the documents get those sent out to the exchanger and to the title company handling the closing set up a new bank account for every exchanger so you're Money is never commingled with company funds or any other exchanger's funds. So most of it is done on the front end. So yeah, the upfront fee is your risk. If you don't complete your exchange, obviously you won't pay the $250 for the replacement property side because we don't have to review a contract and commitment and so on for that end of it. Um, but yeah, that to answer the question that the upfront fee is, is, I guess, your risk for trying the exchange, which usually pales in comparison to what you're looking at for the state and federal tax hit. And it's, it's usually worth doing that to see if you can find what you want. For sure, no, that totally makes sense. Um, and I guess the, my question from before is, um, you know, is there anything else that we didn't hit on? I mean, I realize you've crammed probably an hour's worth of information into 25 minutes here, but is there anything else, particularly for us realtors, uh, that you would say we should know about this process? Anything I've missed or didn't ask? Well, maybe just one, I mean, there's, you know, thousands of things we could talk about, but maybe one that I do think comes up a little bit more often that's good to know is that in a 1031 exchange, the IRS expects the exchanger to have the intent to hold the property for either productive use in a trade or business. So, it, you know, it could be your brokerage office, it could be your dental office, that's always okay. Or they want you to hold it for investment purposes. And that's what, you know, most exchanges are. Now, that is as opposed to people who are primarily holding the property for resale. Okay, so there's easy examples there. If you're a big home builder, you buy land, you divide it up, you sell, you know, build houses and sell them off. The IRS does not want that home builder to be able to use 1031 and never pay any taxes. So it's meant for investors, not really for people who their primary purpose is resale. So you get into a lot of gray areas there, but one thing everyone on the call wants to know is if your client really wants to do flips, true flips, they're buying it three months later, they're selling it, they wanna do that again and again, they're really not meant to be 1031 eligible. Now we have clients that do it. Sometimes they say, hey, I intended to rent that out for the next 20 years, but the markets are hot or they got a, they got an offer they couldn't refuse. And, and that's legitimate when it's true. When that's true, you can do those things. But of course, if you do it every three months, you're selling every three months, you're selling at some point, it's not going to look too good. So sure, sure. Um, it is important to know that you, you want to think of these as properties. My dog's really getting anxious. Uh, you want to think of these as properties that you're going to hold for investment purposes. Hopefully you can show some rents coming in before you sell it. Gotcha. No, that, that's, that's great. Um, 
any other frequently asked questions? Uh, let's see, here's another one. So it's best to have a contact, a contract completed uh, to exchange quickly. Can I have a new contract on an exchange dated prior to closing Great of question. me closing on the property I'm exchanging? I think you said yes, but now does that necessarily turn into one of those reverse exchanges or could I already be under contract? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and dates of contracts are really not important in that sense. It's only the dates of the closings. Closing. That matter. So to do a standard exchange, it's perfectly okay to be in contract on what you're going to buy before you've dealt with what you're going to sell it all. But hopefully you can still get the sale done first and use those funds to buy the new property so you can avoid the reverse exchange. Got it. If you do a reverse, it does still have to be set up prior to the time they buy the new property. Everything has to be in place. Again, we would typically take title. Then the IRS gives you 180 days to get the old property sold. But that's all based on closing dates, not contract dates. So Wonderful. Greg, I'm seeing thank yous and awesome information. So uh, I knew this was going to be phenomenal. I'm going to have you, I'm going to ask you to do this again sometime, you know, in a few Love months. To. Uh because I think uh, the information is really valuable. Uh, and every, every, I just want to reiterate the, your contact information. It's in the chat box. And if anyone needs it, you can always get a hold of me. You've all registered for this event. So you know how to get a hold of me. Uh, Greg can be reached at greg.smith at IPX, that's Indigo Heater X ray 1031.com or 866 443 1031. Um, any last words, Greg? I mean, I don't know how you'll top off all that. It was wow. I just, that's all I can say is wow. No, I appreciate being here again. Just if we didn't get into it, any questions that you want to answer, just just shoot them to me in an email. I'm happy to take care of those. And thanks so much for having me on today. Cool thing. Cool, cool beans. Uh, and if you guys, uh, I got to throw this out. If you're watching this on YouTube, uh, make sure to subscribe to our channel because we have great information, great guests all the time. So thanks so much, Greg. Uh, everyone have a great rest of your day. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right,